Our next speaker is Sarah Teichman. So Sarah obtained her PhD at LMB in 1999, and following her postdoc research at UCL, she returned to the LMB to establish her own lab in 2001. In 2013, she moved to the EMBL EBI and the Wellcome Center Institute. And in 2016, she became the head of the cellular genetics program at the Wellcome Center Institute. Sarah is an EMBO member and a fellow of the Royal Society. Welcome, Sarah. I want to start off by saying thank you very much to Kathy Weston, you know, for this fantastic idea um, and for writing her amazing book that really looks at the science and history of LMB from a different perspective. And also thank you to Marianne, to Hugh, to Jan for supporting the project and, and whoever is in charge of the financial support. Um, I was asked basically whether I was happy about, uh, you know, the chapter that was written about my life and work. Um, and I want to say that Kathy wrote it in a way that was much more beautiful than I could have ever done. So I just want to say thank you, Kathy, for telling our story. Um, I want to talk today very, very briefly um, about the, the time that I was at LMB and, and, and the science that uh, we did there, and then go on to the sort of second chapter of, of uh, my career out on the Welcome Genome Campus in Houston. And really the, the uh, uh, common thread in the story is um, that I like to think about global principles of biology. So organizing basically the vast amounts of data that we have available now from protein structures to genome sequences to gene expression data and identify principles and particular principles of assembly. So I joined the LMB in 1996 as a PhD student in Cyrus Chotia's group. Uh, so Cyrus is one of the founding figures of bioinformatics, although he didn't like that word. He called it computational biology. Uh, I'm trying to be patient with this point. But, um, but in any case, what you can see, sorry? Yeah, so I, I, I uh... <laughs> it's, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> so you can see us here. This is uh, an art photo uh, taken by J Julian organized this. That's why it looks kind of more vintage than it is an artistic when group leader at LMB. This was Cyrus's little group at that time it was a, a, a little group, but it packed a lot of punch. And you can see that it's sort of um, unusual, I guess, in, in, in that it's uh, dominated by women kind of in that day. And this is really uh, also, you know, Cyrus was special in that he thought differently. And um, he did computational biology in the day before bioinformatics is, existed. You know, he worked with uh, uh, women and had a uh, lot of women in his lab and, um, uh, you know, it was a really amazing PhD experience. And, and I'm incredibly grateful, um, you know, to him. And he, he passed away the, before the pandemic. And, you know, there was a nice um, uh, sort of uh, funeral and one that I couldn't go to. But anyway, the, the, um, the, the excitement in that era, for all of you who, 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 are, who are younger, was the completely sequenced genomes. Okay, so there was complete bacterial genomes, complete fungal genomes that were coming. That was incredibly exciting for computational biologists. And you can see me here um, at a protein society meeting in Cambridge and the, the old tech kind of poster, the little Venn diagram kind of printed out and little sheets here for people to take away. You know, not there were, this was before QR codes existed. And um, the, the, the topic is protein families in bacterial genomes. And of course, what the, the sequences allowed us to do was to compare them to each other, cluster them, identify which proteins were related to each other, both within and across genomes, and compare to protein sequences. And that was where uh, our kind of competitive or unique selling point was, in a sense, that we were using uh, also hidden Markov models, so machine learning already in that day, basically for matching the... the um, the structure to the sequences and sort of expanding our view of the protein universe in that way. I then went down to London for postdoctoral research uh, with one of the other founding figures of bioinformatics, and that's Janet Thornton, who then became the director of the Embo European Bioinformatics Institute. And I was exposed to a different way of doing science there. She had a, a huge group, over 30 people, and she led it together with Christine Orengo, who's another professor at UCL. And so they had this massive environment. You saw four people there. There were like 
30 or 50 people in total across all the groups doing bioinformatics. And that was incredibly exciting and sort of exposed me to a different way of, of uh, sort of doing bioinformatics. And then during that time when I was a Byte fellow down there, I was interviewing at Stanford for an assistant professorship uh, that Michael Levitt uh, kind of invited me to, to go visit. And then I came back to a meeting at LMB. I know it, it, no, it was, no, sorry, it was a, a conference somewhere downtown. And I was at the, um, at the bus station right outside the old LMB on the, on the, not far from here, bumped into Richard and Richard said, well, why don't you come back as a program leader track? And so I thought, well, okay, could be a good, good deal, um, you know, together with a junior research fellowship that I had at Trinity, uh, had a very a nice life living in college um, and um, building up my group here and didn't really have to worry about very much except being able to focus on the science and that you know, that was a good thing because I started off with uh, myself and Madan. So, uh, you know, not, not, not much um, a, a, a sort of um, a critical mass, let's say so, but, but there was time to do my own research, write single author papers, write two author papers. And um, what we did was basically uh, use network theory to analyze uh, regulatory networks in, in uh, transcriptional regulation. And, and that's Matt and there, he came back as a program leader track um, in 2006. And for seven years, we had a, a sort of extended group of myself, Clarice, Madam, and we called ourselves Theoretical and Computational Biology, TCB, get it? And, um, and we had a huge amount of fun. So there was a really cool kind of period of time here where there was a lot of computational biology um, of course, you know, uh, none of us are here anymore, but it was a, a lot of fun while it lasted. And during that time, what uh, one of the sort of major um, topics of my group was understanding principles of protein complex assembly. So the question that we're asking there is when, when subunits are synthesized by the ribosome and they're, they're folding, then how do they find each other in the cell? So we've seen all these beautiful protein complexes. And basically how after, you know, we know about folding from our first and folding nucleus and the hydrophobic core and so on. And then how do they assemble? So is it like a random bumping into each other or is it an ordered pathway for small and medium sized soluble complexes? And we use again, our good friend graph theory here to, 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 to kind of represent the protein complexes and their symmetries uh, in, in the biological units. And then predict the, the pathways of assembly based on buried surface area and, and sort of the, the hydrophobicity um, uh, and, and showed also that the, um, the, the sequential steps are evolutionary conserved. And this, this was um, uh, validated in vitro by Carol Robinson's incredible macromolecular mass spectrometry, where she basically took our predictions and then um, uh, had uh, purified protein complexes, which were often sent by crystallographers, disassembled and reassembled, and, and showed that the, uh, the intermediates basically corresponded to the intermediates that we predicted computationally based on the, um, the structures. And I should say that um, uh, you know, during that time, Maya came along, uh, which, which is my first daughter, and you saw the photo of her, very cute, that Laurie showed. And um, 10 days after Maya was born, I basically, I came in and did an, an interview for a PhD candidate called Tina Paritza, who's a brilliant uh, professor in Zurich now. Um, and, and Jane Clark, who was here, collaborated with, with us on Tina's PhD. Anybody who's given birth knows that 10 days after giving birth, like there is significant pelvic pain, sleep deprivation, pain in other parts of the body and so on. And it, it sort of made me think, um, actually, this process has not been thought through. If you've got a, a group leader and they've given birth, but they need to keep on being in the system of, you know, PhD student interviews, purchasing approval, uh, all these different things, it, you know, it hasn't been thought through. And then, of course, you know, LMB started changing. There were more female group leaders who came through, luckily, because at the beginning in 2001, it was really a, a small fraction. There was the Lorries, the Molinas. And then I also met a collaborator from the Clinical Sciences Center in London, who had, um, who was tenured at that time, who uh, had given birth to a baby with a hole in the heart and was um, uh, going up for quinquennial review uh, about eight weeks after giving birth while waiting for the cardiac surgery and, and was sort of semi-traumatized, I would, or, or, you know, by that event. And I thought, again, like, we need to, 
you know, we need to think about research culture, like, like um, Elizabeth Blackburn has so beautifully elaborated, but we also need to think about rules, okay? I'm German. Uh, I like to say, <laughs> stick to the rules. Um, you know, there, there's an issue here. And so we wrote to MRC head office because it's clearly not an LMB issue. There's a broader issue, you know, across the UK, across the biomedical community and science uh, in general. And, um, uh, uh, you know, that was something that, uh, was part of the story, if you like, along the way. And, and I guess I also felt as a tenured woman, I felt kind of an obligation of looking after the next generation, you know? And, and that's, that's something that I think as senior women, and I know Joan has done a lot of work on this front at Yale, um, we, we have an obligation to make things better for the future, to, to sort of change the world, not only scientifically, but also in terms of our society, wherever we can. Another thing happened during that time, which is the resolution revolution in genomics. And that is, of course, the ability to measure the nucleic acid content of single cells. And the first paper that sort of highlighted this for me was Fuchu Tang and Azim Sarani's paper from the Gordon Institute just down the road in 2009, where they showed the, the, that they were able to sequence the transcriptomes of about five primordial germ cells. And for me, that changed everything because basically it was clear at that moment that you could understand the, the heterogeneity in cells, you could understand the development of cells and, and their interconversions uh, in, a, in a comprehensive way. You see suddenly like this light switched on because previously we had microscopy, we had flow cytometry, we had bulk genomics, but all of those technologies are basically, you know, only showing you part of the story. And so for, for me, that really changed everything. We started trying to do uh, the, use this technology uh, manually, basically in my lab. Uh, it's tough, it's tricky, um, requires a lot of dexterity. They're tiny, quantities and the, the, the fluid evaporates very quickly. And uh, so we, I invited a microfluidics company um, that, that had little chips that, that um, uh, capture individual cells in chambers to LMB. And I really wanted this instrument because it would make, you know, it would put on lock kind of this technology. And four people came to the seminar, myself, one of my postdocs, and then two immunologists, uh, Andrew McKenzie and Alex Betts, bless them. And I decided, you know, it's, it's, there's not, there's not going to be a lot of momentum to purchasing this. I, and, and so with colleagues, I organized a seminar over at the, on the genome campus and 50 people came. And I thought, wow, like this is going to be a lot easier to move to the genome campus and basically get momentum behind getting single cell genomics working. And I was the first and, and only joint faculty who's ever been appointed between the Embel European Bioinformatics Institute which is a computational biology bioinformatics institute and the Wellcome Sanger Institute, which is a genome sequencing institute of sort of human genome project fame, sequence 40% of the human genome and so on. And um, even before I started there, because I had to finish my maternity leave with Laura, my second daughter here in order to have the benefits. Uh, so while I was on the maternity leave, co-founded uh, the Sanger EBI Single Cell Genomics Center with colleagues and um, also thought about research culture and sort of developed this motto for my group when I left LMB and moved there because there was also a harassment case in my group, I should say. Um, and, and I decided I wanna articulate that whoever joins my group, you know, has to be bold and brilliant in their science, but they also need to be kind to their colleagues. And, and, and I really wanna have, have that very clear and upfront. Um, and um, what I should also say is when I was recruited to EBI and Sanger, Janet, who was an EBI director, and Mike Stratton, who was the Sanger director, kind of immediately got what I was saying about single cell genomics, like within a nanosecond. And Mike said to me, well, why don't you just uh, uh, sequence all the cells in the human body? <laughs> it was like, hmm, like we're struggling to sequence, you know, a handful of T cells. But anyway, what was clear to me at that moment, this May 2012, I was pregnant with my second daughter, was that's my human genome project. The human, making the map of the cells of the human body. That's what, that's what's possible in Sanger. And of course, that isn't a new concept. So in Sidney Brenner's Nobel lecture, he says the cell map project, for which we don't need a model organism, because we can just study ourselves, will be one of the things to occupy us for the next few decades. Okay, so this is this is the map of the human body, the cells in the human body. 
what came on the heels of, of the, the resolution revolution in genomics is spatial transcriptomics. And what that allows you to do is to measure the transcriptomic landscape of a tissue section. So you can kind of see if you combine the, the two-dimensional or three-dimensional, if you take consecutive sections, coordinates of the, the, the molecular landscape of a tissue section with the convolution by single, with a single cell data, you then have the whole tissue architecture at full transcriptomic breadth, the full molecular fingerprint of every single cell at three-dimensional resolution. And that's really what the Human Cell Atlas is about. And in 2016, I was then offered um, uh, uh, to become head of one of the five departments at the Sanger Institute, and, and um, it's called Cellular Genetics. And basically, I've, I've built it up from scratch, which has been an interesting learning experience in terms of um, management and organization and recruitment and so on. Um, and and um, in parallel, the built the, the International Human Cell Atlas Consortium. Uh, and when I was uh, basically in the the recruitment for this for this position, and again had multiple offers, so advice to any young men or women having multiple offers gives you options, okay? And it it kind of puts you in a much better position, and it improves your science because you have more resource, um, more more flexibility. Personally, I hired a nanny when I moved from from LMB to Genome Campus, changed my life and changed my science forever. So think practical, as well as being passionate about your science, think practical, is my advice. Um, and the, the, the Human Cell Atlas is, was obviously bigger than me, bigger than Sanger, bigger than the UK. And so to team up and create an international consortium, I contacted Aviv Regev, who advocated for a project with this name, Human Cell Atlas, at the NHGRI, which is the NIH Genome Research Institute. Um, at, for, for a kind of US project. And I said, why don't we combine forces and make this international and global? And, and so together we, we um, built up uh, the, this project basically. And, and we were totally on the same page about how to do it. And the way we did it was by a, a grassroots scientist led initiative. And we had a kickoff meeting with about a hundred people down at Welcome in London. Welcome kindly funded that. And um, basically that kind of snowballed then into funding for the data coordination platform. So Aviv and I are both computational biologists um, and the funding for, for the data, uh, the data organization in a, in a database, obviously, and the computational analysis was really close to our hearts. And the Chan Zuckerberg initiative kind of saw that and supported it. And that was the first grant. And then very quickly, we formed biological networks, including human, de human development. So embryonic and fetal stages of human development. Had lots of meetings, um, got lots of support. And at the moment, we're over 2,400 members and have analyzed over 60 million cells from different parts of the body. And it, it's an open initiative, as I said. So please, if you're interested, sign up at humancellatlas.org slash join hyphen HCA. In my own group, of course, what we were asking is what are the cells and tissue niches in our body? And particular where we were coming from was the immune perspective, which I'd started back in LMB using the mouse systems um, with help from, from Andrew McKenzie and Alex Fett and so on. And the, the, the first human organ that, was, that we mapped completely across all tissues, and, and, and I think the first one worldwide is, is that's comprehensively mapped was the placenta decidua. This is the, 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 the maternal fetal interface, basically, where the placenta meets the uterus in its pregnant form. It's remodeled extensively. And of course, the conundrum here is how do the how does the maternal immune system tolerate the foreign paternal antigens? And that's uh, basically a conundrum that we contributed to answering because we found several mechanisms that, are, uh, that, that contribute to the tolerance basically through NK cells, through stromal cells, through enzymatic mechanisms of uh, tolerogenesis. And then we've studied the immune system in, as I mentioned, human developmental stages. So how does it actually form? How do, how do the cells migrate out to the periphery? In, in mucosal interfaces like lung, gut, and in, in, in heart and skeletal muscle. And also now we're at the phase of cross-tissue immunity in the body. So we're actually at a juncture in the human cell atlas now that's really exciting because we're, we can actually start to assemble the full body atlas. So this is like in the Human Genome Project, the golden path assembly. We can start to think about getting towards the golden path of taking all the cells, limited spatial data, and putting the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. And the way we've... Um, where we're actually arguably most advanced is in human development, where 
we've we've uh, focused particularly in the UK on embryonic and fetal stages of hematopoietic organs like yolk sac, liver, bone marrow, and thymus, lymph nodes and spleen, and also peripheral organs, skin, gut, and kidney. And what we did recently with incredibly talented PhD students, Chen Chu Su and Emma Dan, was pull all of this data together and use it as a way of um, discovering how cell states differ across gestational time, gestational period, and across different tissues. It allowed us to discover new fetal specific innate like BNT cell populations in for the first time, both in human and other organisms. And it, it allows us to discover processes that are happening in unexpected places in the body, like B cell development happening in the gut, which is pretty shocking. So you have naive B cells sort of that the, the make IgM in uh, developing in the gut. And, and, and that's important basically for being able to engineer cells. And I want to again emphasize that all of this was an amazing collaboration with clinician scientist Muslifa Hanifa, uh, with whom all of these papers have been published as collaborative efforts. And um, uh, you know th these, these partnerships with Carol, with Mus, and so on, they're, they're uh, really transformative because they allow you to accelerate your science and form complementary alliances uh, with people who have different skill sets from yourself. Uh, also for adult tissues, um, we, we uh, again in the same, the same time in science as part of this human cell as publication bundle, a second paper uh, came out from my group, which is looking at immune cells across 12 different tissues across the body from deceased transplant donors here from the transplant surgeons at Addenbrooks and also donors in, in New York City. And what we developed was an automated method for annotating and, and predicting the different cell states in the human body. And, and this is at celltypist.org. Of course, now that we're in this era where we have such good coverage of the human body, it's obvious probably to you that the human cell is a molecular guidebook. And it's a, a, a molecular guidebook in the sense that you can search for features of specific molecules across your whole body, such as viral entry receptors. So we predicted that SARS-CoV-2 would enter the body through the corneal front and five of the specific nasal epithelial cells and specific epithelial cells in the salivary glands of the oral cavity. And, and this is a collaboration um, of, across the human cell community led by um, a, a talented Thai student with, uh, together with a, a scientist in the group. It had a big influence back in February, March, April 2020 on public health in terms of mask wearing, and it's been cited over 2,000 times. And uh, equally, if you think about the Human Cell Atlas as a guidebook for drugs, you know, it immediately becomes clear that you can look up, if you know the target of a drug, you can look up where it would be acting and understand uh, side effects, on target side effects. You can understand um, uh, mechanisms of action in detail, basically, in terms of the specific cells that, that they're acting on. You can understand rare disease, common complex genetic variants, and so on. I want to finish basically with a few, again, sort of pieces of advice, and, and, and that is that, you know, like uh, uh, Elizabeth Blackburn said, collaborate, collaborate locally, collaborate globally to accelerate scientific success. And that's something, you know, in the narrow kind of tenure track, let's say intellectual credit kind of um, thinking is maybe, maybe it gets lost. Um, but we need to credit people for having that collaborative uh, uh, spirit and engaging in, in, in working together because it can accelerate science for everybody for societal benefit. And, and that, you know, Carol was sort of changed my life in that way um, through all those, those long-term collaborations. And now with Maz, who is a, a senior group leader uh, at, at Sanger and the clinical school at Newcastle, fellow from Academy of Medical Sciences and, and, and so on, you know, it's been similar. And of course, the partnership with Avene to actually make all of this happen that we're at, that we are where we are today, you know, with the human cell atlas community. Um, I also want to say that, um, you know, it obviously takes bandwidth to think about uh, a sort of higher level uh, of how we do science. What are our, our goals, policies, and are we actually optimizing the system, you know, for the greatest benefit? And, um, and this is basically a recent commentary that I wrote with Stephanie Fisher, who's a uh, computational scientist and, and Mark Hanifa, um, which you can look up if you're, if you're interested. I won't spend time sort of talking about it. I just want to finish by saying, as I think Scotty Robinson said, you know, one of the uh, really gratifying things about the academic journey is 
help, you know, the um, empowering and helping other people. And of course, you know, I've mentioned Madan, but there are, there are many, many others. And there's all the sort of generation from LMB, Christine Fogel, Emmanuel Levy, um, uh, Joe Marsh, and that sort of generation here who's now gone on to start uh, uh, labs in you know, bioinformatics, biophysics, proteomics, and so on around the world. And then there's all the, the recent kind of Sanger people uh, who, who are sort of in immunology, genomics, um, single cell bioinformatics, and so on. There's some who've gone on to industry. And we had our 20th anniversary celebration last October, and here you can see the, that. And I just want to um, say thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Really wonderful talk. Do we have any questions? Yeah, it's exactly that kind of thing that the data is so powerful for. So I can't answer that question because I don't have the 60 million cell by 25,000 uh, gene matrix in my head. Um, but that's what cell typist is there for, is that kind of thing. And we'll develop more portals because the data is massive and it's it's a computational challenge to to integrate, um, uh, to, 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 to interrogate and, and serve. But it's that kind of question, you know, that, that, that this data is very powerful for, because it gives you that precise resolution. I thought you were going to say odorant receptors in the nose or something like that. That's another one. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you've got the concept anyway, which is good. Do you see you mean inter-individual variation? Yes, that's right. Do you know that? It's a good question, but really for, for assessing inter-individual variation, you need to have cohort sizes so that you can calculate um, you know, what the differences between individual people are. And, and, and we're just starting that. Um, but you know, the first aim is like the Human Genome Project, what is the human cell hours? That was amazing. Um, how would you recommend that people who want to use these these resources train? Would they just train themselves, or is there training available? You know, to really get into it. There are single cell bioinformatics courses offered by EBI and by Sanger, and actually, sort of my informatics departmental informatics team also runs one or you know, supports one with EBI. Um, yeah, I mean, so so so. Great question. Um, the sort of single cell bioinformatics. I think Emble runs one too. 